Coach in the Fight here, getting ready for the Holy Day season, putting out several classes associated with Passover and with Unleavened Bread and with First Fruits, which are the Spring Feasts. You can check our channel for those we've done classes on the rules, what day it falls on, who's supposed to do it, why we do the feast, where we do the feast. We still have classes coming on how to do the feast. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already so you can see those classes when they come out. In this class, I want to talk about Easter. That's right, Easter. And we want to talk about the differences between Passover and Easter. Now I'm going to use a website to help me out over here. This is a website called lifehopeandtruth.com. And it has the five major differences between Passover and Easter. Now, I wanted to do this class because a lot of people are confused about Easter and what Easter is. Some think it is a replacement for Passover or a replacement for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Some think it's just a new way of celebrating Passover. Some think it's just a fun holiday. And since everybody else is doing it, they may as well be doing it too. Especially since the kids have so much fun. But I'm here to tell you that there is a major difference between Easter and Passover. So let's step down through this website. See what it has to say about the differences between Passover and Easter. And let's compare this to what we understand about Passover and Easter. All right, starting right here, it says, Most consider Passover a Jewish holiday and Easter a Christian one. But when they compare the biblical Passover with Easter, we find something very different. See, this is what I mean. There's a lot of people who believe this. This is what they teach at many churches. is that the Jewish feasts have been done away with or is for the Jewish people or for the Jews or, or Jesus done away with them. And they are to do Easter now. And so many of them will reject the Passover feast and do Easter. Oddly enough, is when I thought I was making headway with some of those guys and convinced them to stop doing Easter. Instead of them going and doing Passover, they went and made a whole new celebration to do talking about the Messiah's last words or something like that that they're going to do on Good Friday. But anyway, let's see what this site has to say. It says, if you ask most people what they would associate the words Passover and Easter with, they will probably get something like Passover is Jewish and Easter is Christian. But would this basic answer be correct? There is a big difference between Passover and Easter. But you may be surprised to learn that it isn't that one is Jewish and one is Christian. Here are five major differences between the two. Number one, biblical origin versus no biblical origin. It says the origin of Passover is found in Exodus. The Israelites had been under harsh slavery to the Egyptian Pharaoh who had refused to let them go. Because of Pharaoh's stubbornness, God sent a series of plagues on Egypt and was about to send the tenth and final plague, killing the firstborn of all people and animals. God would spare or pass over only those who smeared lamb's blood on their doorway. This could be found in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12 and 13. The day was called the Passover and was kept by Israel as a memorial of their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Exodus chapter 12 and 14, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. Okay, so it's talking about the biblical origins of the Feast of Passover. And it's starting there with the Egyptians. But I would argue that Passover was instituted even before that. Because if you go back and look at Abraham's story and how he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, that date, is commonly understood to fall on the day of Passover. And then when you look back at the time when Abraham went in to defeat the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and the rest of those guys, the priest of the Most High God, 
who is Shem, came to celebrate with Abraham with bread and wine, the sacraments of the Feast of Passover. Now, I'm not disagreeing with what they're saying here. I'm just adding a few more fun facts. I believe to make what they're saying here to be true is it was first written down on paper that they were to keep the Passover feast in Exodus chapter 12. Let's go on. What about Easter? You can't find Easter commanded in the Bible. The word is actually found in Acts 12 and 4 in the 1611 King James Version. But most scholars recognize it as a clear translation error. Most translations replace it with the word Passover. There are over 70 references to Passover in the Old and New Testaments, but no legitimate references to Easter. Okay, now here, I'm going to disagree with what this article is saying. Not with the part where it says that there's no Easter commanded in the Bible. That's absolutely true. We've never commanded to do anything associated with Easter. To do so would be to change the holy feast days. And as we know, our Father doesn't change. Those feast days, Passover and the rest, were written on the holy tables. Meaning they were rules even before man became man. Even before Adam existed, those rules were written down that we would keep Passover. And to change those rules will make our father appear to be indecisive, like he couldn't make up his mind. Well, we know that not to be the case. But look at this part right here, where it's talking about Acts 12 and 4 in the King James Version of the Bible. And how this is the only translation where you will find the word Easter. Now, I always thought that I that the King James Version is the only Bible that you would find the word Easter. Now, I'm a King James only person. And I have always been a King James only person all the way back to 1995 when I had to set a King James Version down beside a New International Version to understand what it was talking about. But like I said, this puzzled me on why Easter is actually listed in the King James Version. And I, too, was thinking that it was a translation error until I stopped and took a hard look at it one day. Let's go over there and look at it. We're up here in Acts chapter 12, verse 3. It says, And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Okay, so we'll take this real slow in order to understand my point here is that unleavened bread had already started. In verse 3, it's saying that they were in the days of unleavened bread. And we know that unleavened bread is the second of the holy feasts. It starts after Passover and it lasts for a week long. So Passover had already taken place, and now they're in a week-long feast of unleavened bread. Then look at verse 4, he says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So, in verse 13, we see that Passover has already taken place, that's in the past, we are they are presently in the feast of unleavened bread but they are waiting on Easter I believe the word Easter is actually legitimate here I believe that the King James Version is the only Bible that actually got it right but that's just my humble opinion so let's go on number two says God ordained versus human tradition one of the major differences between Passover and Easter is this the Creator God commanded Passover to be kept by His people. He never commanded anyone to observe Easter or commemorate Christ's resurrection. Okay, now this sounds like the argument they made at first. And God commanded are the same thing. We read over there in John chapter 1 verse 1 that God is the Word and the Word is God. But I can see why they went forth to make this 
distinction as it says right here that our father never commanded anyone to observe Easter or commemorate Christ's resurrection it is not his resurrection that gives us salvation guys we have to understand that it's important to the understanding of the story it was his dying on the cross, that blood that was spilled on the cross to which we are all saved. That's why we have a chance of surviving in tribulation. That's how, why we have a chance of going on to meet the Father one day instead of being destroyed in the lake of fire. It's because of the blood that was shed. That was the important moment maybe the most important moment in the whole bible was when the messiah died on the cross but let's go on who commanded easter's observance it is a historical fact that the catholic church commanded easter's observance in the council of nicaea in a.d 325 church leaders did not appeal to the scriptural authority only their own authority to make the change Sadly, Christ's warning against substituting human tradition for the commandments of God was ignored. Referencing Matthew chapter 15 verse 3 and Mark chapter 7 verse 13. One of the reasons why I'm doing this class now is because I wanted to get these websites off of my computer. But sadly, I went in and closed all of the websites that I had for the Council of Nicaea. And you see that little airplane thing down there? That means I can't get them back right now. But I went in and looked at the notes from the Council of Nicaea, and what they're saying here is absolutely right. They commanded the Easter's observance during that council. That was one of the things that they talked about during the Council of Nicaea, was whether they was going to keep Passover or whether they was going to keep Easter, and when they was going to keep Easter. And the end result of it was that they gave it in the form of a command is we will keep Easter so what they're saying right here is that it is a historical fact that the Catholic Church commanded Easter's observance the Catholic Church now we understand a little bit about the Catholic Church over there in the bot in the King James Version of the Bible the papacy is referred to as the beast. If you read Daniel and put that together with Revelations, you understand that the papacy is the beast. And then understanding that the Catholic Church came out of the papacy, it shouldn't be hard to make a connection that by keeping the feast of Easter, you could actually be taking the orders of the beast. And then when you jump over in the book of Exodus and seeing how Passover and unleavened bread are the mark on our hand and between our eyes, which makes it the mark of God. So replacing it with Easter would be taking on the mark of the beast. But we'll leave that for another class. Let's go on to part three. It says fixed day versus movable day. God ordained the Passover to be kept annually on a specific day, the 14th day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar. That's found in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and 1, Leviticus 23 and 5. The Catholic Church persecuted the early Christians who kept the Passover, calling them quarter decimans, Latin for 14 in Judaism. Now, it's talking about this Hebrew calendar here. The Hebrew calendar was the original calendar. Some call it the Enoch calendar or the sacred calendar. This is the calendar that was instituted by the Father. The calendar that you are observing when your months start with new moons. It begins in the spring, like any new year should start in the spring instead of the middle of winter. And in its first month is when you celebrate the spring feast, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Now notice this part down here where it says the Catholic Church persecuted the early Christians who kept Passover. See, you got to understand that Easter was a holiday that was being observed long time before the Messiah ever came down to the earth. 
Some could argue that it was observed even before the Messiah was thought about by man because it goes all the way back to Babylon. Nimrod and his wife Semiramis and their son Tammuz. If you understand the story of those three individuals, you will understand where we got Christmas and where we got Easter and where we got Valentine's Day, respectively. And we're talking about the Babylon where they built the Tablet of Babel. It was Babylon during that period that happened right after the flood with Noah. That's when Easter got started along with all the other pagan holidays and mythological gods and many other knowledges and wisdoms that are supposed to be forbidden by man. Now, the Catholic Church going in and persecuting the early Christians who were keeping the Passover, stopping them from keeping Passover, and making them keep Easter is something to think about when we think about who is the Catholic Church. And to think of it in those terms, it shouldn't be surprising that revelations cause the Catholic Church the harlot that sits on the beast. The papacy being the beast and the church being the harlot. But let's go on. The Passover was so despised that in 325 CE, the Council of Nicaea established that Easter will be held on the first Sunday after the full moon are carrying on or after the vernal equinox. From that point forward, the Easter date depended on the ecclesiastical approximation of March 21st from the vernal equinox. This gave Easter a movable date that wouldn't fall on Passover. Even then, the Western churches used the Gregorian calendar and the Eastern churches used the Julian calendar, so their dates for Easter differ. Okay, so now, I've looked at this, how they calculate the date of Easter. And what it appears to me, the way they calculate Easter makes it fall during the Feast of Unleavened Bread every single year. Now, one thing we understand about the Feast of Unleavened Bread is that we are supposed to put away all leaven out of our house. And when we read in, in the New Testament how the Messiah was referring to leavening, is we can make the connection between leaven that we were supposed to remove out of our house and church doctrine that we were supposed to remove out of our house. In other words, for one solid week, we were not supposed to have anything to do with church doctrine. We were supposed to rely to totally on the word of God for our scriptural knowledge. In other words, we were supposed to read the Bible for that week. No other man's words or hearing no other sermons on the scripture, just the scripture itself was supposed to be consumed during that week. How, but when you look at how the date of Easter is calculated, it falls in the Feast of Unleavened Bread every single year. Every year. I think that is no accident because we're, we're told that the mark of the Father back there in the book of Exodus is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we understand that Easter is the opposite of unleavened bread. We see in Exodus that if we partake in any leavening during that week, how we will be cut off from our people. So by putting this leavened feast, Easter, right in the middle of unleavened bread, actually cancels out the Father's feast for those who partake in it. And there are many who are partaking in it by accident. You got to understand, we are spirit led. Most of us have been baptized. This spirit inside of us can cause us to do stuff unknowingly sometimes. And a lot of what this had, a lot of what Passover and unleavened bread has to do with is rest and abstaining from going to church and such. So a lot of us do that by accident. But when we get up on that Sunday morning and go down there to church on Easter, we cancel all of that out. That's why there's a lot of people out there trying to make the connection between Easter and the mark of the beast. 
Are we receiving the mark of the beast on Easter Sunday? But let's go on. Number four says, Memorial of Jesus' death versus his resurrection. Jesus Christ was ordained as the Passover lamb that will be sacrificed to make freedom from the penalty of sin possible in John 1 and 1 to 29. The Passover of Exodus 12 pointed towards the Christ sacrifice 1,500 years later. Just as the Israelites were saved from death by the Lamb's blood, we can be saved from eternal life by Christ's blood. Through baptism, the same way he changed that water into wine, he also changed water into blood. Because if you think about how in the Old Testament we're taught that you cannot have the forgiveness of sins except for through blood. Except for through the shedding of blood. But then in the New Testament we understand we can get forgiveness of sins or remission of sins by way of baptism. So the, the Messiah turned water into blood. That's an original thought, by the way. I may need a little help with that one. But let's go on. At his last Passover, Jesus instituted unleavened bread and the wine as new symbols representing his broken body and blood. He commanded us to do this in remembrance of me. Luke 22 and 19. The Apostle Paul taught us to keep it on the same night in which he was betrayed. The evening of the Passover. 1 Corinthians 11 and 23. Talking about the Last Supper. Passover represents what the Messiah did for us. How he allowed us to be saved because of his sacrifice. That's why we remember Passover. Easter purports to celebrate Christ's resurrection. The problem is, though his resurrection was extremely important, Christ never established it as an annual observance. There is also no record of the apostles or early church celebrating it. Plus, biblical evidence shows Jesus didn't even rise on Sunday morning. You have to understand that Easter has nothing to do with the Messiah. They're force-fitting that holiday around the Christian symbols in order to get Christians to celebrate it. But... It is actually goes back to Nimrod and sun god worship. That's why they hold Easter on Sunday for sun god worship. Because that is the day they worship the sun. And Nimrod and sun god worship go hand in hand. Now, I'm going to have to disagree with some of this. Because we have to remember what feasts are ordained according to the Holy Scripture looking back at Leviticus 23 when you look at Leviticus 23 and 9 you see that there is a feast associated with the first fruits and we understand that the Messiah to be the first fruits the first of the resurrected from the dead so this is an annual celebration of the resurrection of the Messiah. You say, well, how is this celebration different from that of Easter? Well, first of all, you notice that, that this holy day follows on the morrow after the Sabbath day. So in the Christian church, this would have been Monday. So if the holiday Easter wasn't centered around a Babylonian goddess with Easter bunnies and eggs, an unwitting believer may try to make a connection between the third holy convocation of the year, which is first fruits, the time when the priests make a wave offering. So to say that the resurrection of the Messiah was never established as an annual observance may not be totally correct. But if their goal was to celebrate the resurrection of the Messiah, they wouldn't have resurrected an old pagan feast to do so. 
they would have celebrated the third holy convocation of first fruits. But let's save that for another class. Let's go on to number five. Passover symbols versus Easter symbols. Symbols of the Passover are full of meaning. Jesus himself is our Passover and sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. The unleavened bread represents his sinless and broken body. Matthew 26 and 26. And the wine represents his blood that was poured out for us. Matthew 26 and 28. The foot washing represents the humility and serving attitude of Jesus, which we are to emulate. John 13, 5 through 8, 9 and 11, and chapter 12, verse 15. Notice that these symbols have little to do with materialism. Other than the unleavened bread, which is something that you eat, the foot washings may be the only other symbol that you can see with the naked eye. And I would argue that all of these symbols are spiritual in nature and not materialistic at all. The primary symbols associated with Easter are eggs and bunnies, but those have deep roots in ancient pagan practices. Bunnies and eggs are ancient fertility symbols that were appropriated years after Christ's resurrection. Even the name Easter has origins in an ancient pagan goddess. Easter is the celebration of an ancient pagan goddess. Whereas Christmas is the celebration of an ancient pagan god. And so is Valentine's Day and Halloween. And about four more holidays around the calendar. But here he's talking about the Easter eggs and the Easter bunny. Now there has to be a lot of people wondering what Easter eggs and bunnies have to do with the Messiah. But the answer is nothing. That's how they worship the fertility gods. Eggs represent fertility. As almost all creatures on earth that has the breath of life has eggs in their fertility cycle somewhere. And a bunny, pound for pound, produces more meat than a cow each year. They can have about 15 baby rabbits every month. And the word Easter going back to an ancient pagan goddess. In the book of Kings, we see her name as Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. This is the goddess that Solomon's wives were worshiping that got him in trouble. Let's go on. It says, what does that have to do with Jesus and his sacrifice or his resurrection? Nothing. That goddess centers around sun god worship and fertility. They worshiped that God so their crops would grow every year. So the moral of this story is that Easter is not Passover and Passover is not Easter. And celebrating Easter can get you cut off from the children of Israel. And maybe even get you the mark of the beast. In fact, only moments ago, our beloved president, Donald Trump, just announced that he wants packed churches during Easter, even though we're in a pandemic. I predict that would be the date of the largest national outbreak that America will see in this pandemic. But only time will tell. So go ahead and hit that like button if you got something out of the video. And go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can learn about feasts that we are supposed to keep. Leave us a comment. And Shalom.